Hi, I'm Dr. Mike Bauer and I'm here today to talk to you a little bit about the canine cranial cruciate ligament. Uh, most people know it as the ACL, anterior cruciate ligament, so that's how we'll refer to it today as the ACL. Uh, and it's a very common injury in humans. It's also a very common injury, probably the most common injury we see in veterinary orthopedics, small animal orthopedics uh, to be specific. And the first thing I'd like to do is talk a little bit about the anatomy of the ACL and I have a couple different illustrations. One is I have this model that I'd like to show you. So uh, this is a plastic model that I'm going to kind of show you how it would sit on my knee and it would sit on my knee uh, just like that. And a couple of anatomy points is the bone above the knee. Uh, this one is the femur. The bone below the knee is the tibia, and an important concept is the top of the tibia is the tibial plateau. Uh, now we'll try to zoom in a little bit more on this. And again, the femur is above the joint, the tibia is the bone below the joint, the top of the tibia is the tibial plateau, which we'll come into a lot of discussion as we go on. The ACL sits between the two bones and connects the two bones, and it's that thin ligament that I'm touching with my little finger. That stops that motion in the joint. And then within the joint are two shock absorbers, uh, each one called a meniscus. So uh, I have one more uh, an anatomic illustration on the computer screen here, so I'd like to, like to show you. Uh, and in this, once again, we see the tibia, below the joint, the femur above the joint, the tibial plateau uh, is the sloping line that we see on the illustration, uh, and then the ACL is labeled on the illustration, uh, and in this uh, illustration the PCL is shown as well, and that represents the posterior cruciate ligament or PCL. So that's uh, the quick anatomy review, and so what I'd like to go to next is kind of mechanisms of how the canine ACL tears. The biggest question on everybody's mind is why so many dogs are tearing their ACLs. Uh, of course, you as a pet owner want to know that. Me as a pet owner, I want to know that too. And as a veterinary surgeon, uh, I want to know that. And we don't have a straightforward answer. Uh, we've looked at all types of issues on weight and size and uh, conformation breed and, and, and we're not coming up with clear-cut answers on underlying common denominators. But we do think that dogs tear their ACLs by chronic biomechanical stress, uh, unlike a human. I mean, a human tears their ACL with athletic trauma as acute, quick injury, and dogs we think happen little by little over time. And a lot of that has to do with the anatomy in dogs versus humans. and. I've got my uh, knee pants on today, so first let me show you a human knee. And in humans, the top of the tibia is pretty level, and maybe four to five degrees slope, but pretty level. And the way that we tear our ACL is a football player hits us from behind, the tibia thrusts forward and stretches and acutely tears the ACL. On the other side of my pants is embroidered a canine. Uh, stifle joint, and it, the big difference is in a canine stifle joint, the tibial plateau slopes down and back. So when dogs bear weight, they do this chronic little sliding motion, and that little sliding motion puts the ACL under chronic biomechanical stress, and we think that is a key component uh, to the reason why dogs are tearing their ACLs. Uh, so that's, that's the difference between humans and dogs in the mechanism. I've got some arthroscopic photos from four different patients that kind of show that progression. Uh, and so the first one's a normal ACL that I'll show you. The first is a normal uh, ACL and uh, it's a nice broad ligament with tight fibers. Uh, the next is uh, a ACL that has become loose, uh, it's degenerate, it's starting to fall apart. You can see when I push on it with a probe that it is uh, soft and it, that should be a really dense ligament if normal. And we think that progresses into actual fibers tearing free 
and this would represent kind of the classic partial ACL tear with fibers free, and we think that then goes on to a full blown out ACL, which is what we see in this patient. Where it almost looks like a mop head that's been ripped in half with all the uh, big fibers. Uh, and so, to summarize, we don't have an exact reason why so many dogs are tearing their ACL, but we think the common denominator is this chronic biomechanical stress. And that's one reason that we think when a dog starts to tear their ACL, they are virtually always go to full tear. In fact, there's no documented case uh, anywhere in the literature uh, where a ACL is starting to tear in a dog and it stops tearing and heals. We think that doesn't happen because of that chronic biomechanical stress. That sliding motion that creates that biomechanical stress, that's also why dogs don't do well with an ACL tear that's not repaired because as they bear weight they slide on the tibial plateau. So that whole biomechanical uh, aspect it, it, it is an important key point to why dogs tear, why we feel like dogs need repair to have a good functional life if they are tearing or torn, and it really dictates for many of us how we do the repair. So from that, let's move on to the clinical signs you would expect your, your pet to have, your dog to have if they tear their ACL. So regarding the clinical signs that we see in dogs with ACL tears, it's quite variable. I mean, quite a few patients will be completely non-weight bearing or barely touching their foot down. That's not atypical. Some dogs will have a subtle lameness. It all depends on what degree of tear they are in at the moment. Some dogs will have a very acute, fast onset. They probably have been tearing little by little and then boom, the straw that breaks the camel's back as they hop off of the steps and tear their ACLs and they go from fairly normal to almost non-weight bearing and other animals will have a slow, insidious, worsening lameness. Uh, one thing that dogs do clinically when they have any degree of ACL tear is they usually will sit with that leg to the side. So in full tears and more severe cases, uh, they'll sit like this with their feet to the side instead of that nice little tight sit that dogs typically do. And many dogs will sit with their feet to the side as a lazy sit at times, but dogs with ACL tears, even when asked to sit for a treat, uh, they will either kick the leg out or sit, sit with the, both legs pushed to the side. So that's the most common clinical signs that we see. Uh, let's go ahead and figure out then how we make that, that final diagnosis. The way that we diagnose ACL tears in dogs involves a couple modalities. Uh, for example, uh, palpation is what we usually start with. So during clinical examination, we'll actually palpate the joint for instability. That instability is often referred to as cranial drawer or anterior drawer, and some patients will have that but the majority of dogs that tear their ACL actually won't have drawer because there'll be some different version, some different level of tear, not fully torn, and they, their, their knee will still be stable even though they may be very, very lame. Uh, and in chronic tears, they develop so much fibrosis and scar tissue around the joint that we don't feel cranial drawer as well. So that is one of the things we do, but that's not a, a, a real accurate way to diagnose ACL tears. We look for joint swelling on palpation, and that helps us to increase our level of, of suspicion that an animal does have an ACL tear. We often use radiography, x-rays, and it's very helpful uh, in a tentative diagnosis of an ACL tear. There are certain changes that we look for uh, on an x-ray that increase our suspicion. Ultimately, the gold standard for diagnosing an ACL tear in a human and in dogs is arthroscopy. And so all animals that, that uh, are suspect for an ACL tear should, the first thing we should do is an arthroscopic exam. And we do that at the onset of surgery. So they're under a general anesthetic, they're in the operating room, but we start with an arthroscopic exam to be 100% sure of the diagnosis before we proceed with the surgery. And the arthroscopy kind of looks like this. 
where the scope is inserted through a small opening in the skin and we can evaluate everything within the joint, the ACL, the PCL, the meniscus, very accurately with an arthroscopic exam. So that's the definitive diagnosis uh, is made with the arthroscopic exam. So now that we've made the diagnosis of the ACL tear arthroscopically, now we move into the repair phase. And the repair is somewhat controversial. Uh, there are three competing techniques out there. One is a replacement technique with synthetic material. Uh, another is making a bone cut behind the tibial tuberosity and advancing that tuberosity called a tibial tuberosity advancement, also abbreviated TTA. And the other is leveling the tibial plateau, doing a tibial plateau leveling osteotomy, which is bone cut, and that's abbreviated TPLO. Uh, I've been at this for quite a few years and have had the experience, uh, had the opportunity to have experience in all of those techniques. Uh, the, the, the replacement technique, I've done literally thousands of. I've done hundreds of the tibial tuberosity advancements and uh, again I've done thousands of the tibial plateau leveling osteotomies. And this could be a long-standing debate, but suffice it to say that with experience with all three of those, if my dog tore her ACL tomorrow, she'd get a tibial plateau leveling osteotomy, a TPLO. I mean, she's had one, but the, I wouldn't, wouldn't hesitate to do the same procedure on her other side if she tore her other side someday. And I will say the majority of board-certified surgeon colleagues that I have uh, with experience in, of all those techniques feel the same way and to some degree it's what we're most comfortable with in our hands but uh, I think the tibial plateau leveling osteotomy is the gold standard right now has been for a decade and is still right now for canine ACL repairs and I have a little illustration on how that works and uh, this is the same illustration that we had uh, before looking at the anatomy and so again the ACL connecting the femur to the sloping tibial plateau. Now during weight bearing the femur slides down and back and that creates this stretching, stretching motion that pulls and tugs on the ACL uh, and so that's the mechanism. So arthroscopically we clean that up and once we're finished cleaning that up, then with a very specific bone saw, we make a slick cut, do the rotation, and, and fix a bone plate into position. The bone heals wonderfully. And of the many thousands of TPLOs that we've done, we've never had an osteotomy not heal well. Uh, and bone is the best healing structure in the body. All tissues in the body, connective tissues in the body, for the most part, heal together with scar tissue, uh, but bone doesn't. Bone actually grows bone across a cut or a break, in this case a cut, and it goes back to nearly or as original strength. So now let's talk a little bit about post-operative care after in our hands a TPLO and long-term prognosis. The way that surgery works in this practice is patients are able to go home the day of surgery uh, because they get an epidural. They're under a general anesthetic. Anesthetics these days are very, very safe. Uh, and when they're under the general anesthetic, they receive the epidural to deaden the nerves that go to the knee so we can use less anesthetic and then they're able to go home that evening. Uh, so we move from x-ray and epidural into the operating room, do the arthroscopic examination, if all of that fits, then we open the skin about four or five inches in an average size lab uh, to do the TPLO. Surgery takes about an hour, which is about an average amount of time for that procedure. Uh, then uh, from there, they end up back with mom or dad during the final phases of recovery and usually leave the hospital a couple hours later. That evening, our patients are usually comfortable. They're virtually always comfortable, uh, sleepy. Uh, the doctor calls you the night of surgery to check on your pet and here at CCO uh, the clients are all given the doctor's own phone numbers as well. 
So usually by the next morning they're up and moving and doing fairly well, putting a toe touching pressure on that leg and with, when, within a week they're putting some pressure down and within a few weeks they're putting a moderate amount of pressure down. Usually by the six to eight week range they're doing really well, uh, but it takes about 12 weeks for the, for the total healing. Uh, the biggest post-operative problem with ACL tears, whether it's a human or whether it's a dog, is that animals and humans without ACLs have a tendency to develop some degree of osteoarthritis. We feel that the TPLO minimizes that effect over any others, but we, there still is some development of osteoarthritis. There is a misconception that the TPLO actually causes arthritis, and that's absolutely not true. Uh, it's a progression uh, of a joint that's missing their ACL. And again, we feel that the TPLO minimizes that. Unfortunately, about 40% of dogs that tear one side, someday tear the other side. And uh, we feel that that number is also uh, diminish to some degree by giving them the best leg we possibly can and in our hands that's via the TPLO. So overall uh, patients that have had TPLO or the ones that have had TPLOs right and left leg at least 95 percent of our clients would say they do it again their pets leaving a, li living a fun full active life uh, chasing the ball in the backyard, going along on a horseback ride or a mountain bike ride or a run. Uh, and so overall, the prognosis is very good. Thank you for taking time to watch this little video. I think I'd like to leave you with the idea that dogs that tear their ACLs really do need to be repaired. Unlike a human, some humans can do fairly well with an ACL tear without repair, but we have level tibial plateaus, which I think makes all the difference. So uh, if your dog is showing these clinical signs, none of us want our pet to have major surgery, but to lead a full happy life, dogs with ACL tears need repair. So whether we're able to do that for you or another board certified surgeon is able to do that for you, it's critically important to your pet's long-term well-being. So hopefully this has been informative, uh, and, and if your pet has an ACL tear, good luck. It's a fixable problem.